Hey guys, this is my second audio blog, and this one is for the ladies. Today we are going to be talking about manifestation and how it relates to the divine feminine. Now manifestation is something that a lot of people are interested in and a lot of people want to know about, and there's really good stuff out there, but the jump in logic that it requires can be so vast for some people that I feel like anyone who can explain it in a different way is valid and is useful. So forgive me if for some of you I am beating a a dead horse, something you've known forever already, and you're like, yeah, well, so there are still a lot of people who have trouble with switching that logic up. So if I can be one of many who can put a personal spin on it and show you a different perspective on the same laws, these unchanging laws, hopefully that makes this worthwhile. So let's get into it. So manifestation, how does that work? Okay. So to talk about manifestation, there's a couple of premises that we need to establish. One, that everything is vibration. Okay. For some people, that's the hardest to swallow. What do you mean? You know, I see all these physical things around me. I see the physical world around me, the reality, quote unquote, dirty word around me. And that is real. Okay. Mm, Yes and no. Right. So if you put your hand on the closest solid object that you have near you right now, whether it's your computer or a table or a chair or whatever, you put your hand on it, it feels solid. Okay. The only reason it feels solid is because your hand is vibrating at a different speed than whatever you've just touched. If you and that table or that chair or that computer were vibrating at the same speed, you'd be able to put your hand right through it, like basically X-Men style. Okay. Now, where are there references to this idea that everything is vibration? Well, I mean, it starts from the Bible. We can go all the way from the Bible to Nikola Tesla. So in the Bible, the beginning of the Bible, the first words of the Bible are, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God. Okay, so in the beginning there was the Word. The Word is a sound. In the beginning there was a sound, and that sound was God. Sound is a vibration. We also know that sound creates shapes. If you are interested, look up on YouTube something called cymatics, C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S. Cymatics is the process by which you can change the shape of things with sound. Okay? So sound creates matter. Vibration creates matter. So from the Bible, let's move forward or let's move backward for a second. Ancient Hindu script scripture tells us very plainly that the sound om is the beginning and end and everything key to the manifestation of this universe. Om creates this place. Om contains within it every sound needed to create every shape, animal, and doing and being that occurs in this dimension. Okay, so again, that's a sound. Again, that's a vibration. Okay, so we go from ancient Vedic Hindu literature, hop to the Bible, and then we hop to somewhat present day, Nikola Tesla saying, if you want to understand the world, you need to think in terms of vibration and frequency. Well, why? But just like that solid object you touch that happened to be vibrating at a different speed than you, every other object around you is also just vibrating at a different speed than you, which is why you can see it, which is why you can't put your hand through it. So everything around you is vibrational, including you. All right. So moving forward from that premise... How does manifestation work and how does it relate to the divine feminine? So let's leave vibration alone for a second. Let's leave manifestation alone for a second and let's focus on what it means to be a woman. What it means vibrationally to be a woman. Okay, where does this concept of the divine feminine fit in our society today and how in the world does it fit with the idea of manifesting and using the law of attraction. Okay, well, it's pretty simple. A woman is by her very nature a bridge between two worlds, between two dimensions, if you like. A woman is a vessel 
through which a new life with a soul from a different plane is able to enter into this world, into this life, into this plane. So a woman's body is basically a bridge between worlds. We are vessels. A vessel is mainly an empty thing, is it not? Now, what is the most useful part of a cup? I love this. Alan Watts talks about this a lot. What is the most useful part of a cup? It's the empty space which the cup produces. It is only the empty space which the cup produces that can then be filled by something. In ancient Chinese philosophy, a woman's greatest power is seen as yin energy. Yin energy is all broken lines. When you look at a set of six dotted lines, what you see is a vessel. What you see is a pathway through. And that's what we are. We are a pathway from the next world through into this world. Okay, so the idea of us being the only ones who are vessels, who can have souls pass through us and manifest themselves physically into this world, the fact that we are the ones that are able to do that means what? Means that we are inextricably linked to this other world. Well, if we're inextricably linked to this other world, that means we have access to it. If we have access to it, that makes us very powerful manifestors. But we're not, are we? We're not. Men still run the world. Men still get paid more than us. We still get beat by them. Right? We still get criticized and demonized in the media. Right? Women are not allowed to step out of line in any way without society really going after you. Right? Now, how does that fit with what I just said about us being incredibly powerful manifestors and being connected, being a connective being between two worlds? How does that fit? You would think that someone who is a connective being and very, very attuned to the source through which all manifestation comes, you would think that a being like that would be extremely powerful. Well, yes, yes, a being like that is extremely powerful. So what do you have to do to keep that very extremely powerful being in line. What do you have to do? You have to render her powerless. You have to render her ability to manifest useless. And the only way to do that, the most effective and long lasting way to do that is to make her doubt herself. Because once she starts to doubt herself, she is going to manifest all that she did not want. And she will not be the one running the world. She will not be the ones in parliament. She will not be the ones that are prime minister. She will not be the ones who are the head of major Fortune 500 companies. No, she won't. She'll be sitting at home wondering why she can't get herself with fake eyelashes and extensions and injections and a face full of makeup. Why can't she make herself look like the one that everybody wants? The one that all the guys are Instagramming and Facebooking and looking up and, you know, screenshotting photos of so they can show their homeboys. Yeah. No, you you can't be that person. You can't chase those ideals and still be a powerful manifestor. Well, why not? Because, and this leads me to the major crux of this blog, which is how does manifestation work? And then now that we've established what the divine feminine is, then we'll swing back around and connect the two. So how does manifestation work? Simply put, manifestation is the ability to attract that which you are already feeling. Now, that's an incredibly simple and yet very difficult concept for a lot of people to understand. If I told you that someone who was robbed was in some way attracting the robbing, I would get in a lot of trouble with people, right? Because it seems like I'm I'm saying that they were asking for it. And what I'm saying to you is that vibrationally, they were. Let me give you a more concrete example. When you are afraid, the thing you're afraid of happens. And very cynical, worldly people will say, well, no, it didn't happen because I was afraid. I was afraid that it was going to happen. And you see, I was right. 
So there's a lot of ego that plays into it. Whereas the other way, the other way that has to do with manifestation and the divine feminine, there is no ego involved in it. There is no idea that there is no idea that you are right. There is no idea, there is no concept of I have proven that my way of being afraid, that my way of being worried and wary of what was going to happen ended up justifying itself. No, that doesn't exist because when you are thinking in terms of manifestation, you the first concept that you have to understand and you have to understand it fully before you can move towards doing anything creative with the ability and really creating the things you actually really, really want in life. The first thing you have to understand is that every single thing that is happening to you, regardless of what it is, regardless of how good or bad or disgusting or awful is only happening because you have a belief Probably, usually, a deep-seated belief that that thing that is happening is what should be happening, is what you are worthy of, is what you are deserving of, It is, or in some people's cases, it is just the quote-unquote reality of the situation. Now, a lot of people get caught up there. They get caught up with the idea of reality. I'll give you a little example. I was in the car with my younger brother. I was driving to the airport. He was with me. He was going to take the car back. And we're sitting in traffic. And admittedly, you know, I have a tendency to get to the airport late. I really cut it close when I have to travel. But we're sitting at the Holland Tunnel exit of the West Side Highway. And it's looking pretty bracked up. Yeah, I'll admit. It, it was looking pretty ugly for a second. And Ali pipes up, my younger brother pipes up and says, you know, I don't think you're going to make it. This traffic's really bad. Typical, you know, like something that someone would say. And I didn't say anything, even though, you know, I understand that vibrationally what he's doing now is he's attracting this thing to me. Um, But I didn't, I didn't say anything. I was just like, oh, okay. And then he said it again. And then he said it again. And I was like, hey, hey. Stop being so negative. And his response was classic. It was classic Capricorn, classic male, classic just, um, classic for those who are unable because of this belief to manifest what they want. His response was, I'm not being negative. I'm being realistic. Okay. So there are a lot of people when you talk to them about manifestation and you say, well, you attracted this thing to you because you were afraid of this thing. They say, no, I wasn't afraid of this thing and that's why it manifested. I was just being realistic. I knew that was going to happen because that's the realistic thing to happen and that's why it happened. So what you're basically saying is this thing that's happening, this, this world, these people, all these situations, they're happening to you. You have no active part in creating these situations. You are simply and merely a reactor to things, which is completely false. It's actually the exact opposite, but the exact opposite brings with it an enormous amount of responsibility. It's difficult to look around at your life and think, I am responsible for this, especially if life isn't going the way you want it to go. Say you're sitting by yourself right now, extremely, extremely lonely or fucked over or really upset or really hurt. And you're thinking, well, fuck you, Umber. What the fuck? What do you mean? This is my manifestation. What the fuck do you mean that I did this to myself? Yeah, I know. I know. I know it hurts. I know it stings. I know it sucks. I know it's a total fucking head trip, but it's still true. And unless we can find a way to dissect this and talk about it and get you to a place where you understand that any other way of being makes you a victim, then you will never be able to manifest and create your own reality. And that is what you want to do. Okay. So once again, that's a very long intro about nothing or just 
not nearly as interesting as the stuff we're going to be talking about from here on out. Okay. So manifestation and how it works. Manifestation and vibration are very clearly and very closely related. If I am vibrating at a frequency of love, of joy, of expansion, of confidence, of calmness that arises from that confidence and that joy and that love, the vibration that I am on is going to sync up with everything else swirling around in this quantum universe of endless possibilities that also has the vibration of fun, engagement, love, success, abundance. Why? Well, because like a TV set, if your brain, think of your brain as a TV set and you've got the remote, what you've done is if you've changed the channel. And once you've changed the channel, a completely different show and a completely different picture is on the screen. Now, it doesn't mean that that other channel isn't there. It doesn't mean that it won't always be there. It just means that you've changed channels. So your reality now consists of all that will be attracted to you based on the vibe that you are at right now. Okay. But then number, how do we change our vibe? Okay. All right. So how do you change your vibe? How do you change your vibe so you can go from being a reactor to, first of all, a responder, and second of all, someone who is truly above the fray of life's little ups and downs? How do you do it? How do you raise your vibration to a place where you are at all times content and blissful and happy about what's going on? Well, as ridiculous as this is going to sound, it's pretty simple. You have a tool within your possession that lets you know every single time you have fallen into the wrong frequency. Now, what do I mean by the wrong frequency? Okay. There's a right frequency and there's a wrong frequency. The right frequency is any time you feel good about what you're doing, about what you're thinking, about what you're being, about how you're dressing, about how you look. And the wrong frequency is when you're sitting somewhere and thinking about all the things that you don't have, all the things that you really quote unquote want, all the things that you should have had, all the things that were owed to you, all the people that you miss and that you wish were there. Now, why is that the wrong frequency? Well, this just gets to the heart of the entire thing. Hey, this might be like the shortest audio blog ever. Why is one wrong and why is the other right? Okay, well, it's very simple. The universe does not attract, understand negatives and it doesn't attract negatives. So if you say in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, if you feel, God, I don't want that guy to call me anymore, guess what? He's going to fucking call you because what the universe is hearing is it doesn't hear I don't. Do not want him to call me anymore. It hears everything but the not. It hears, I do want him to call me again. Right? If you say in your mind, I don't have enough money, I, or if you say people have a tendency to do the positive affirmations, not realizing that they're manifesting the negative. So if you say, I really would like some money, I would really like some money, I would really like some money. What you're saying to the universe is, I don't have any money. I don't have any money. I don't have any money. And the universe is like, oh, you don't have any money? Well, the universe's job is to give you more of whatever you're feeling. So if you say, oh, you don't have any money? Well, here's some more poverty. Here's some more not having money. Right? If you walk around saying, oh, uh, like I know a couple of unfortunate Indian girls who have these weird skewed beliefs that, you know, once you're over 30, there's just no good men around and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. Well, what you're doing is you're basically telling the universe, I believe that there are no good men around. And the universe is like, okay, we'll give her more of that. Give her more of there not being any good men around because that's obviously what she wants. That's what she's thinking about. That's what she's saying. So it's, the universe is a kind of, not simplistic, but a very simple way of receiving 
whatever is already going on. The, the universe is just going to mirror whatever you are already thinking and feeling. Let's take another example. Missing someone. I miss him. I miss him. I miss him. I wish he was here. And the universe is hearing, he's not here. He's, he, he's not here. He's not here. He's absent. He's absent. He's absent. And it says, okay, well, here's some more absence. That's what you're thinking about. That's what you're fixating on. That must be what you need somehow. So here, take it. Take more absence. So I, I wish I had more money. That's just going to attract poverty. I, I, I never have enough money. Okay, well, here's some more of not having enough money. Right? I, m- I miss him so much. Well, here's some more missing him. Whatever you give it, it's going to multiply it and give it back to you. Right? Again, let's go back to the Bible. Ask and it shall be given to you. Well, you have to understand that you're asking all the time. You're asking and receiving all the time. Now let's swing this back around to the divine feminine. You're asking and what? You're asking and receiving. Well, who's better at receiving than a woman? A woman is a vessel of reception. We receive, we grow, and we pass through, right? We receive the soul of the child, we grow the child in our bellies, and then we pass it through into this physical realm. We are receivers. So, okay, we've got the receiving part down. What is standing in our way? Why aren't we all doing really, really well and having lots and lots of money and being super respected by our mates and by our children and everything? Why? Why? Why are we receiving the opposite for the most part? Because, again, let's go back to the Bible, ask and it shall be given unto you. What are you asking for? If what you're saying is, I miss him, I miss him, I miss him, you're asking for more missing. If what you're saying is, nobody has enough money, things are really hard right now, nobody has any money, money is tight right now, the universe is like, all right, okay, money's tight right now, here you go. Here's some more of not having any money. Right? And I know that seems simplistic. I know it seems simplistic to think, well, if I just think this way, this is going to happen. But I guarantee you that's exactly how it does happen. That's exactly how it happens. Every time you put a thought out of something that you are lacking, you are attracting more lack because that's how the law of attraction works. Every time you're putting out a loving, confident idea or story or thought about yourself, you're attracting more liking and more confidence, right? So let's now tie this to a very ancient myth. And I'm going to just shout out um, my girl, Billy the Kid here, because she was asking today on Instagram about this. And I think it's a really good tie-in. The myth of Shiva and Parvati is a truly endearing myth. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful story and it illustrates the power of the divine feminine and the ability to manifest in, in a really poignant way. So let's use that as an example. And that kind of answers her question about the importance of Shiva and what his story is. And it's a great lead into what we've been talking about with this, just the power of women and our ability to manifest things very easily because we are manifesting machines. We are creators, right? We are creation machines. So the myth of Shiva and Parvati goes something like this. Shiva was married. Lord Shiva was married. His wife died. When his wife died, he went into a secluded meditation. He was distraught and he loved his wife very, very much. And he didn't want anything to do with the world after that. He wanted to just go into an ascetic meditation and sit there for the rest of eternity until it was time for him to destroy the world and fuck shit up. In the meantime, there is a monster born um, in another realm. And it is so powerful that only Lord Shiva can destroy it. And if Shiva does not awake from his meditative trance-like state and destroy this monster, the monster will indeed destroy the world. Now, the the amount of symbolism and just 
uh, beauty of Hindu scripture and mythology is just beyond words because even that scenario right there is perfect on so many levels. Like Young must have had a field day with Hindu mythology. I'm actually, I know he did. <laughs> um, okay. So I believe is Lord Vishnu who goes to Shiva and says, Hey, you know, this monster is, you know, and, and, and Shiva's not having it. Shiva's just like, look, leave me alone. I'm very, and this like hundreds of years have gone by and he's just very distraught about his wife and he just doesn't want to hear anything about anything. He does not care. So they go to the spirit of his deceased wife and they say, you got to help us. Like Shiva needs to destroy this monster. He's going to destroy the world, but he just won't snap out of this meditative trance. And we don't know what to do. He's the only one that can help us or else the world is going to be destroyed, but he doesn't seem to care. So the deceased wife says, don't worry. I will reincarnate. I will come back. I will reincarnate. I will marry Lord Shiva and I will break him out of his stupor. And then he will once again be a quote unquote useful God, right? He will take care of this monster and all will be well. And Vishnu is kind of like, mm, are you sure? Can you do it? No, he doesn't seem like he's going to budge. He's really distraught and he's really stubborn and he's just very, you know, strong and he's not hearing it. She's like, listen, like, leave it up to me. I'll do it. So she reincarnates as a young girl, as a, a girl named Parvati. So Parvati, when she reincarnates, she loses her memory. So Parvati grows up as this princess who has this undying, burning devotion to Lord Shiva. And she prays to him all the time and she, you know, does all the bhajans and the pujas. Puja just means prayer and bhajan means like a prayer that you sing um, and does all the offerings and everything. And then soon, I mean, she's very beautiful and everyone around wants to marry her. It's very like the Penelope Odysseus story, the Homer story, the Odyssey. Um, I mean, it's it's similar in that respect, but very different in every other respect but anyway. Um so finally, her father comes to her and says, you know, all these people are wanting to marry you. You are coming of age. What, you know, what do you want to do? And she says, well, I already know who I want to marry. And the father's like, what? Who? Who do you want to marry? And she says, well, I want to marry Lord Shiva. And the father is just like, um, that's cute, but... Lord Shiva has been sitting in that cave in that mountain for way, way, way a long time. And I don't think he's interested. Maybe you should pick somebody else. And she says, no, no, I, 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 it's only him. It can only be him. Well, why? Well, I don't know why. It just can only be him. So the father says, okay, well, I can take you to him and I can offer your services as a servant to him. You know, maybe you can help in his meditations. Maybe you can uh, help in the pujas and the prayers and bring flowers, fresh flowers for the altar and stuff. Maybe you can, you know, help him in that way and kind of, you know, get into his sights because you are very beautiful. So maybe once you get into his sights, he will, you know, fancy you and there you go. Okay, so that's a good idea. So Bhadavati and the dad go up to the mountain cave where Shiva has been meditating. And the father presents his daughter and says, you know, Bhadavati would like to help you with your pujas and gathering new flowers in the mornings and whatever else and milk and blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, he doesn't even break his meditation. He just kind of acquiesces and nods in acquiescence and, and, and that's it. Okay, so he hasn't actually looked at Bhadavati. Right, because he's in this deep state of meditation. That's why uh, most of the time when you will see Shiva pictured, you will see that he his third eye is open. Right, so he's sitting in this deep meditation, and Bhagavati is uh, dutifully and diligently bringing flowers and milk and all the other things that she's supposed to do. Well, and of course, you know she's the proximity to him is making her love and this like undying kind of unnatural urge that she's got to be around him, this kind of obsessive quality of the love that she has for him that she doesn't understand herself. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's getting worse or better. However you want to put it, it's intensifying. So one day 
I'm not sure exactly what she does if she drops something or if she says something, it escapes me now. She somehow gets his attention. And for a moment, his meditative state breaks and he actually looks at her. Now, when he actually looks at her, he is overcome because she is so incredibly beautiful. And then the, oh, right. I remember what happened. Wait, this is really good. Let's go back and put that in there. So she doesn't drop anything. What she does is she gets tired of the situation because Shiva's just not seeing her. The dude is not feeling her. He's never even looked in her direction. He won't speak to her. She's just like, what is going on? So she goes to the Hindu god of love, whose name is Kama. And Kama is a big black dude, really muscular, made of like some kind of black stone or something. And he's got these really, really strong, agonizing arrows. So it's the Hindu mythological version of Cupid, except he's not a little soft kid with these little arrows that he shoots at people and they fall in love. It's like this big, robust, muscular guy, very virile. And he's got these arrows that have names that are just like, you know, like lovesick, heartbreak, um, You know, so much in love you can't eat, so much in love you can't sleep. So it's kind of agonizing love arrows that he shoots at people. So Parvati goes to Kama and says, you got to help me because this dude won't even look at me. And it's been like a while now that I've been doing this. And I go there, I'm there, I stay with him in the cave. He just never sees me. I don't know what to do. Like help, let's help the situation along. Yeah. Kama's like, okay. Kama goes, Kama shoots him with an arrow and just for a moment, Lord Shiva's meditation is broken because of the arrow. So when the arrow hits him, he his eyes fall on Bhargavati, and he realizes that she's insanely beautiful. But in that moment where he has the realization that she's really beautiful, he's also cognizant of the fact that his meditation has been broken and that something is amiss. So once he realizes that something is is amiss, it takes him no time at all to realize that Kama has indeed pierced him with an arrow, and that is why his meditation was broken, and that's why his eyes have fell on Parvati, which of course makes him really, really mad. So he opens his third eye and burns Kama to death, turns him to ashes out of anger, and he tells Parvati to leave. Just get out. I don't want you here. Get out. Don't come back. Bhargavati tries to plead with him, but he's he's Shiva, man. He's the destroyer god. Like, who the fuck wants to fuck with Shiva? Like, this is a scary person, right? This is a scary being. So she scampers away. When she leaves... She doesn't know what to do because she still has this undying love for this being and she can't even explain why she's got it. It's so obsessive and just deep for her. And this being has never even looked at her more than once, but she still got this like shore in her bones feeling that this is her husband, right? So what does she do? Parvati finds a mountain and she goes and sits there and she meditates 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 for so long on the personage and idea of Shiva that she comes to a startling cascade of realizations. Now, I'll tell you what the realizations are. And I'll wrap the story up for you so you know how it ends. But just look at what just happened. So Parvati goes from trying to affect her physical world with physical actions to a place where she is no longer physically exerting any control, but only working in a vibrational space, right? She's working with her vibration. She's working with her frequency. So she goes and sits at the side of this mountain and she meditates and meditates and meditates on the idea of Shiva, her love for Shiva, right? And her surety when it comes to the 
when it comes to Shiva being her husband. She's just absolutely sure of it. So she sits there and meditates and meditates and meditates, and then she has an epiphany. What's the epiphany? The epiphany is just that her vibration changes, right? So her vibration changes. She has this epiphany, and the epiphany she has is, this is where things get really deep, she has the epiphany that, one, she is the reincarnation of his deceased wife. Okay? That's the first realization she has. The second realization she has is that, albeit a marriage, a, a, a partnership, essentially it is not. The next realization she comes to is that there is no separation between Lord Shiva and Bhagavati. They are one being. So through deep contemplation and meditation, what she realizes is that she is, in fact, Lord Shiva. She is, in fact, Lord Shiva and Parvati and the union of them both. She realizes that she is him and he is her. And when she reaches that point of knowledge of self-acceptance, of the acceptance of your own very high worth, what happens? Well, this man appears to her, this young man, and he says to her, why are you so beautiful? Why are you sitting here like these ascetics who run into the forest and meditate and turn into skin and bones and look like scary, scary creatures? Why, why are you out here? You're such a beautiful young girl. And Parvati says to him, very matter-of-factly, I'm meditating for my love. I'm meditating for the man that I'm going to marry. I'm meditating on him and his love for me. And the man says, you know, of course, amused, um, who is this person that you are doing this for? And she plainly answers, I'm doing it for Shiva. I'm doing it for Lord Shiva. And the guy busts into like laughter. Well, what, why on earth, he says, would someone as beautiful as you want to be with a bum like that? A bum? Okay, well, he is covered in gray ash. Right? <laughs> his hair is matted and dirty. He does wear skulls around his neck and have a snake in his hair because he is the destroyer god. Right? The, the god of death and destruction. Right? So this guy laughingly says to her, why would someone like you, someone so beautiful and fine and pure and clean and delicate, want to be with such a bum? And Parvati, of course, just like you, me, anybody would, if you were talking about the man we love, she loses her shit and like totally insults the guy and puts him in his place. And of course, the guy changes right before her into Lord Shiva and says to Parvati, I am so sorry I'm so, so sorry, and now I belong to you. Now, here's the part that I left out, and it's the part that has to do with working in the vibrational world and how the vibrational world affects the physical world. Now, how did that young guy, a.k.a. Shiva, get there to that mountain to talk to Parvati? You'd think he just woke up one day in the cave when he was meditating and said, oh, that girl that I kicked out, I should go get her. She's the reincarnation of my last wife. No, no, that's not what happens. What happens is, Parvati sits there in meditation for so long that by the time she realizes that she is in fact Shiva, there is a reaction that starts to happen within the entire dimension. Everything starts to heat up. And Vishnu goes running to Lord Shiva and says, we got to do something. This girl is sitting there meditating and she is gathering so much energy behind her beliefs and the intensity with which she's doing this that she's heating the world up and she will destroy the world. Now, when Vishnu says this to Shiva, a light bulb goes off in Shiva's head because he knows that he's the only one that can destroy the world. So if she is showing signs of being capable of doing that, then she must be him. If she is him, she must be his wife because his wife and him were one being. 
So when she, when Parvati exerts control in the vibrational world, she is able to affect the dimension so acutely that the being responsible for destroying this world realizes that she is in fact him because he is the only one that possesses that power. So then he changes himself into this, you know, bastard of a conceited guy and says all this stuff and she tells him off and then he turns into himself and presents himself in all his shining blue glory, blue, gray, black glory to Parvati and apologizes for not being able to see through his sorrow and not being able to see that his wife, his deceased wife had come back and was indeed right in front of him. So, and then, you know, then the story of Shiva and Parvati gets really like sexual after that, because apparently they used to run off together into the mountains and, and like, have sex for thousands of years to the point where like the mountains would rock and all the other gods would be embarrassed. They have a very physically affectionate relationship, a very passionate relationship. And Parvati is the creator of the light and Shiva is the destroyer. And so they merge as one. Okay. So Billy got her explanation of the Shiva myth and we hopefully all of us, all of you listening have realized that this is essentially a thousands of year old way of explaining what I've just been explaining to you is the power of the divine feminine. As vessels, we are incredibly powerful at manifesting and working in the vibrational world. Now, this I'm going to give you an analogy that should really help this soak in. If I'm doing my makeup and my eyeliner is crooked, which it always is, I always have to go back with a Q-tip and fix it and even it out because I'm like team winged eyeliner all day. If my eyeliner is crooked and I am standing in front of a mirror and I can see that my eyeliner is crooked and I take a Q-tip to that mirror to try to change the shape of the wing that I've just made, I could stand there for 20 years rubbing on that mirror, it is never going to change what is going on on my eye, right? So that is exactly how this world works. Well, not exactly, but yes, 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 exactly. Not the mirror and the eyeliner and stuff, but exactly. When you try to change things in the physical world, what you are doing is you are trying to change the reflection you are seeing. Now, The easiest way to fix that eyeliner isn't to stand there for 20 years and rub on that mirror because that's not going to do shit. The easiest thing is just to change myself and then change what's on my face, right? And then the reflection will reflect the change. Okay, it's the exact same way. Whenever you feel like you are exerting control over the physical world around you, you are chasing your own tail. The physical world does not exist. The physical world is a reflection of what is going on inside your head. Yes, ma'am. Even your friends, yes. Even your family, yes. Even your husband or your girlfriend or your dog or your kid or your job or your coworker or the traffic or the bill or the sickness. Shall I go on? It is all a reflection of what is going on inside your head. So when you say to me... Life is hard. There isn't enough money to go around. I'm thinking I need to get the fuck away from you because the reality that you are reflecting around you is not a reality that I would like to resonate with because I don't believe that. You believe that. So I know that that's how your life is. If you tell me that life is hard and there isn't enough money to go around, I know that life is hard for you and there ain't enough money for you. And I don't want to be anywhere near it. Right? But if your belief system in your mind, your for real, for real, sincere belief system in your mind is that there is more than enough money for everyone in the world. There is more than enough abundance for everyone in the world. There is more than enough wealth and luxury and all the things we want and dream about and need. There's more than enough of that for everyone. What do you think the world is going to reflect back to you? It's going to reflect back to you more and more abundance. Right? 
So how you get into a space where you are constantly manifesting those things which you actually want. Okay. The only way to do that is to stay in alignment with that gigantic energy source, the universe, God, Jesus, whatever you want to call it. The only way to get, to manifest, to think up, manifest, and get what you want is to be in alignment with that source from which all is coming to you. Okay, stay in alignment. Got it. How do you stay in alignment? How do you do it? Well, you've got a very, very good tool at your disposal. That tool is your emotions. When you are in alignment, you feel good. Your emotions will tell you when you are in alignment. When I woke up a couple of days ago and it hit me all over again that that douchey guy broke up with me and I was alone, I felt terrible. You know why? Because my inner being was like, bitch, what are you manifesting right now? What are you doing right now? This feels terrible. You are negatively creating right now. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And I felt worse and worse and worse and worse. So your emotions will tell you when you are in alignment or when you're out of alignment. How do you know you're in alignment? You feel good. You feel great. And guess what happens when you feel great? The world seems great, doesn't it? And it just keeps seeming great and keeps seeming great and keeps getting better and better and better and better, right? Right? Because it's a reflection. Now, what's it going to reflect back to you when you say, oh, well, I, I really, really miss that person. That guy was the one for me, and now I don't know what I'm going to do. The universe is like, oh, okay. She misses that person. That's the only guy for her. She's not going to be able to do anything without that guy. So guess what happens in your life? You keep missing that person. You keep getting to not be with that person because that's what you're asking for. When you like something, you're asking for it. When you don't like something, you're asking for it. You're always asking and you're always receiving. So you got to get real, real careful about what you believe because from your beliefs is what you're asking for. And when you're asking, your emotions will tell you if you're asking for something good or if you're asking for something bad. Because if you're sitting there crying and weeping and sad and upset, you are asking for the wrong things. And your inner being is trying to tell you through the mode of emotion, excuse me, that you are asking for the wrong things. So one of the other questions I had on Instagram today was, Well, does manifestation work for a goal that I want to reach? Okay, yes and no. If you have a goal in your mind that you would really like to reach and you keep saying, you know, I really want this thing, I really want this thing, I really want this thing, what are you saying to the universe? What you're saying to the universe is, I don't have this thing, I don't have this thing, I don't have this thing, I don't have it, I don't have it, it's absent, it's not here, it's not here, it's not here. And the universe is like, okay, it's not there. Got it. Yo, don't give her anything. It's not there what's a productive way to reach your goal? I got this. I got this. I got it. Doing it. I got it. The universe is like, yo, she got it. Give it to her. Right? For all the Christians out there, I'll give an example that my man Joel Olstein dropped on me a couple of weeks ago. Jonah in the belly of the whale. Jonah's sitting in the belly of the whale. He knows he should have gone to Nineveh. He knows He didn't. He knows why he's in the whale. He knows what he did. And the prayer that he offers up is quintessential manifestation. In the belly of the whale, he offers up the prayer, I know that my God has saved me from this. I am already saved from this. The universe is like, oh, he's already saved. I don't know, I don't know why, the universe doesn't look at you and say, hmm, no, he's still in the will, he's not saved, no, the universe doesn't work that way, the universe is not looking to see what you are doing, the universe is not micromanaging you, it's going off of your vibe, if your vibe is, I'm not in the whale anymore, if your vibe is, God has already saved me from this, then the universe is like, oh, he's already saved, 
Get him out of there. Right? Same thing applies to weight. Look at it in terms of weight. There are people who are constantly trying to lose weight. Really just want to lose 10 more pounds. Really just want to lose 10 more pounds. Really just want to lose 10 more pounds. And what are they saying to universe? I'm 10 pounds heavier than I should be. I'm 10 pounds heavier than I should be. I'm 10 pounds. And the universe is like, this bitch is 10 pounds heavier than she should be. She's heavy. I give her more heavy. Right? Now, what's what's the proper or productive way to manifest that thinness that you want? I'm thin. I'm doing it. I'm working out. I'm eating right. I'm thin. I'm getting thinner every day. I am thin and I love it. What's the proper way to manifest that man you really want to marry? Not... Guys out here are such douchebags. I was talking to this guy and he turned out to be a liar and a douchebag. I was talking to this guy. Don't ever online date. There's just creeps and douchebags everywhere that just want to fuck people. Everyone's such a douchebag. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Well, why are you doing that? Well, I'm just being realistic. There is no such thing as reality. Quantum physics has already proven this. Okay? There is no such thing. It is just a world of quantum possibilities. And you happen to be picking out of the billions of possibilities in the world, you're picking that one possibility where every fucking guy you meet is a douchebag. You are doing that. You are doing that. Nobody else. Okay? Let's take this example to Islam. In Islam, we are told that the best way to make dua, the best way to pray and ask for something is to feel in your heart when you have asked that God has already given it to you. Do you see the similarity in all these different places? Do you see the similarity in all these different belief systems? You have to believe that the thing you want is yours already. And the universe is like, all right, she's got it already. Give her some more. I'll give you a personal example before I wrap this up. My birthday has three sevens in it. I was born on May 27th, 1977. So when you write it out, it is 5 slash 27 slash 77. Okay. When I was five years old, I went to have my passport renewed because I'm gangster because I had a passport when I was two weeks old because I was internationally traveling when I was two weeks old. No wonder I'm always on fucking planes. I went to the passport office in New York when I was five years old with my dad. My dad did my hair. My dad raised me. Um, My mom was always at work. So my dad made, you know, did my hair real cute, put me in a real cute outfit, you know, even put a little, my dad's nuts. My dad put like a little bit of eyeliner on me, all that, all that. I was looking good. I was looking fresh. We went to the passport office and I'll never forget it, even though I was so young and most people don't remember stuff from that age. I guess, no, actually most people do. I don't remember most stuff, most things that happened at that age, but I do remember this. So we go to the passport office and my dad's really big on and has always been really big on getting me to do things myself because he really wanted to raise a tomboy kind of girl. He wanted a strong woman as a daughter because he just cannot stand weak women. It just, he gets angry. He gets angry when he sees women being weak. He gets angry when he sees women getting played. He gets angry when he sees women crying, like furiously angry. And in that way, him and my mom are a perfect match because my mom is like OG hardcore, strong as fuck. Um, So he wanted to raise me kind of in her you know, to follow in her footsteps. So he would constantly put me in situations that were tests of my ability to handle pressure, of my ability to communicate with people who are older than me, um, and to build my confidence, kind of trial by fire stuff, a lot of it. But I'm really grateful for it because I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. The only thing I'm afraid of in, in the only thing that I fear is God and that's out of respect. I'm not afraid. Um, so I, I, and this is because he's trained me like this. So at five, he hands me my two photos and he gives me all the passport papers and he says, go ahead, you're up next, go to the window. And I'm like five, I can't even reach the fucking window. And I'm like, but dad, like daddy, like uh, what? And he's like, go. Okay. So this is a drill sergeant, ex military drill sergeant. When he says, go, you go. Right? Six one drill sergeant. Okay, go. Okay, all right, I'm going. So I go up to the window, like 
you know, on my tiptoes, I slide the woman the papers. The woman looks at the papers, and she looks at me, and she looks at the papers, and she looks at me, and she says, well, my, my, you've got three sevens in your birthday. You're really lucky, aren't you? And I looked at her at five years old, and I said, yes, I am. I'm a very lucky person. And she said, well, has anyone already told you that because of the three sevens in your birthday? I said, no, no, it's not because of the three sevens in my birthday. My mom told me that from the moment I was born, money started coming in. And she said, well, see, there you go. You're a lucky girl. And that was cemented into my brain. I thought, yeah, I am a lucky person. And then when I was about 12, 13 years old, my brother, who's four years older than me, was dating a girl who had a very interesting book called <clears throat> The New Astrology by Suzanne White. The New Astrology is a mix of Eastern and Western astrology. So it takes your Eastern Chinese sign, which is done by year, and it takes your Western sun sign, which is done by month and day, and it combines the two. So you can be, for example, a Pisces horse or um, a Virgo cat. Oh, God, that would be a horrible sign to date. Um, sorry, I have such a thing against Virgos now. Um, in my case, a Gemini snake. So I'm um, about 12 years old. I'm looking through this book. I find my sign. I'm reading it. And the first line in the book is like, first of all, snakes are extremely lucky. And this is a fact. In China, when you have a snake child born into your family, if, he, you know, if the child happens to fall on a snake here, snake child born into your family, you throw a huge opulent party. Why? Snakes love opulence. Well, but that's not the only reason. Why would you throw a party for a snake child? Okay. You throw a party for a snake child because the Chinese believe that snakes are very, very lucky. And if you have a snake born into your family, you will never again want for money. Boom, 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 boom. Ding, 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 ding. There's another connection in my head. Okay. My mother said from the moment I was born, money started rolling in. The woman at the passport office told me I have three sevens in my birthday and I'm very, very lucky. My mom's been telling me my whole life that I'm a lucky charm. Here's this book telling me that all snakes are considered incredibly lucky. And then it goes on to say that Gemini snakes are insanely lucky people. I'm like, oh, okay, that's three things in a row. So the belief was really cemented in me at a very young age. Then 10 years later, my brother meets a great girl, marries her. The girl's mom is a practicing Indian Hindu, Punjabi Hindu, and she tells me randomly one day, I used to own a snake. I had a pet snake. She asks me that when the snake sheds, if she could please have the skin. And I'm like, sure, auntie, you know, that's no problem. But what do you need it for? You know, are you going to do like a prayer with it? Or is it something like religious or ritualistic? And she says, no, 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 it's nothing like that. It's just that we believe that snake skin and snakes in general are very lucky. So if you keep snake skin in your wallet, it attracts money. If you keep snakeskin in your books, you'll pass your exams because they attract luck. Ding, 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 ding. One more thing, right? To cement this already very deeply held belief that I am very lucky. Okay. So those things happen. I believe, I do. I believe that I am a lucky person. I do. I, and, and my life keeps proving it to me over and over and over again. I fall ass backwards into the most incredible situations that I have no control over. They just kind of appear to me. I find money. People give me money. I end up finding crazy screwball ways to make money. I, if I want something, it just kind of appears to me. If I want someone, they just kind of come to me. This happens to me all the time. So last year, I am reading an issue of Scientific American Mind, Scientific American Mind and Psychology Today being two of my favorite, favorite, favorite magazines. If you are at all interested in human behavior and why people do the things they do and how physiologically where the roots are for why we do the things we do, I would highly recommend Scientific American Mind. It's amazing. So last year, I'm reading in Scientific American about a study on luck. Well, guess what? It turns out that people who believe they're lucky are actually luckier. 
They're actually luckier. People who believe that they're lucky are actually luckier. And they put them through all these different randomized tests. And, and in fact, the people who believe they were lucky were luckier. Okay, so that's just one small example of how a deeply held belief will reflect in the world around you. So if you are able to stay in alignment, meaning feeling good, stay in alignment with source means feeling good. If you are able to keep yourself in a place of feeling good and you are doing the work of either eradicating deeply held beliefs that are negative Right? You may have a belief somewhere in there that you are unworthy of love because nobody loved you when you were a kid. You may have a belief somewhere in there uh, deep in your mind that you are not quite capable of anything really successful. You may have a deeply held belief somewhere in there that you are just not good enough and your sibling is in some way better or that person is in some way better. And if you were just a little more like this or a little less like that, then you would be worthy. You may have a very recent belief that was put into your psychological space by some douchebag you were dating who put you down. (coughs) Excuse me. Sorry. I had something in my throat. (coughs) That may shift your shift you out of alignment and shift you into a quote unquote reality where nothing fucking goes your way, where you can't get your project off the ground, where you can't find a guy to love you the way that you want, where you can't find the guy that will be the great husband, where you have a guy that you love, but you just can't get him into your life the way you want him, right? All of those things are happening because somewhere inside of you, you have a belief that is keeping that from you. So if you can stay in alignment, i.e. keep yourself feeling good, and you can work on pulling these beliefs out by the root and replacing them with an almost childish insistence. And this is where when people say, Umber, you're so childish. You're, and some people who are trying to be nice will say, like, you're so youthful, you're so... And some people who are trying to be really mean will say, well, you're so immature. Okay, they're all kind of saying the same thing. What they're saying is that I have this sort of childish insistence about things. I believe what I believe. Right? It's like, once again, second audio blog, second fucking quoting of Kanye. Can't get away from it. Can't get away from it. You can't tell me nothing. You can't. You can't. Childish insistence. Take those beliefs, take those really, really toxic beliefs that live deep within you that are keeping these roadblocks in front of you and pull them out by the root and replace them with a childish insistence. I am loved. I am worthy. I am lucky. I am hot. I am successful. All good things are mine. And if you want to go there, if you're, if you're one of the Christ consciousness brethren over here on this side, then all you got to go with is God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne and God loves me. And if you're a new age vegan who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in Christ consciousness and doesn't believe in Judeo Christian Islamic traditions and doesn't believe in Buddhistic. Okay, that's cool. Let's just go with you are thinking shitty things that are reflecting in your reality, making your reality shitty. So let's leave God is on the throne to one side because you don't believe in him, right? Cool. That's all right. Or believe in it actually is the way you should say it. Um, Okay, that's cool. No problem. Let's just go with the universe. The universe is full of laws, laws just as certain and definite as gravity. If I throw a quarter out the window right now, it is going to go down. It is not going to float up. That is the law of gravity, okay? The law of attraction is whatever shitty thing that you think about yourself is what's going to manifest in your reality over and over and over again. But... 
Here's the good news. Whatever wonderful thing you think about yourself is also going to manifest in your reality over and over and over and over again. So why not just be manifesting dope shit all the time? Who says that things need to be shitty sometimes and good sometimes? No. The only reason you think that is because all your belief systems about yourself are not great. You have some shitty belief systems in there. And as soon as you, one, start eradicating those shitty belief systems, to start eradicating people, start removing people from your circle. Because here's the thing, when you think shitty things about yourself, you actually end up attracting people into your life who reinforce those shitty things about you. Those completely made up shitty things about you because none of it's true. That's the other thing. None of it is true. None of it. No matter who told you, no matter how it happened, no matter how many years the abuse went on, no matter what fucked up situation it was, none of it is true. If you decide today, right now, that none of it is true and it can all go kiss your ass and that all is good and you are wonderful and you are beautiful and you are deserving of all good things, then that is the reality that will be reflected back to you. Now, what's going to happen when you start doing that is all those people that you were attracted with your shitty beliefs are going to try to come at you and be like, uh, excuse me, what do, who do you think you are? Well, you can't do that. Well, you can't do this. Umber, we're going to be late. Umber, we're going to be late. You're going to miss your flight. You're going to miss your flight. You're going to miss your flight. This happens to me all the time when people be like, you're not going to make this plane. You're not going to make it. And I always look at them and I laugh because I'm like, you don't understand. I'm really lucky. I'm going to make this plane. <laughs> Inshallah. I'm going to make this plane. Of course I am. Well, how do you know you're going to make it? Because I'm the shit, y'all. Because I'm the shit. When you do this, the people you've attracted with your shitty belief system are going to come at you hard. And that's the final step. When you change your belief system and these shitty people start coming at you hard, you know what you do? You cut them the fuck off. You cut them off. You cut them off because you understand that they are going to keep enforcing beliefs in you that no longer apply to you and they never did. And they're going to fuck with your manifestation and your version of reality. And that is not what you want. When you clean out your vibrational space, when you clean out these shitty belief systems and you implement new belief systems, you are going to have to get rid of these people. Because if you don't, they're going to suck you right back into where you were. And you don't want that. You don't want that, especially once you start manifesting. Once you start staying in alignment, it feels so good. And you know what the best part about alignment is? The better you feel, the better it gets. The better you feel, the better it gets over and over and over again. And just spirals upward, 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 upward until you're just like, yeah, I mean, seriously, this is on a constant basis. Like today, I walked on this forest path to the nearby town, I bought a bunch of groceries, a bunch of beautiful organic fruit because fruit and vegetables is, especially organic fruits and vegetables and meditation is one of the best ways to raise your vibration once you've gotten all these shitty beliefs out of your system because the higher your vibration gets, the more capable you are of manifesting. So I bought all this gorgeous organic fruit. I'm out in the countryside, beautiful clean air, beautiful clean water, quiet, just birds singing, little foxes running around, gorgeous, gorgeous swans in the lake. I mean, seriously, just gorgeous. And I walked home and I got home and I put my bags down and I said to no one in particular, to my empty house, I said, yes, God, thank you, God. Yes, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for the money that bought all this stuff. Thank you for this stuff. Thank you for this house. Thank you for this place. Thank you for my son. Thank you for this body. Thank you for this mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what have I just manifested by doing that? Well, hell, she's loving this. Give her some more money. Give her some more fruit. Give her some more babies. Give her some more love. Give her a, you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Now, another person could have looked at the account that I just told you and had a completely different take on it. Someone with a shitty negative belief system could have summarized my day like this. 
You know, Umber's living about two kilometers outside of town and she doesn't have a car. So she has to walk all the way to town. And then she had to walk back two kilometers with two really heavy bags of groceries. Oh my God, I feel so bad for her. What kind of life is this that she's living? I feel so bad for her. I mean, when she was married, she had all these things and like a car and a husband and everything. And he just drove her everywhere and did everything for her. And like, oh my God, I feel so bad for the way she's living now. Poor her. No, poor her. What? I had a fucking great time. I had a wonderful time walking there. I had a wonderful time talking to people in the town. I had a wonderful time shopping. And yes, I carried two very heavy bags home, but they were full of beautiful, wonderful things to eat that I wanted and mashallah had by the grace of God, the money to buy. Who's complaining about what? The fact that I got to walk home through beautiful fields sprouting with wheat and a fucking sky full of the most gorgeous clouds and the most beautiful summer day with the fucking sun shining down on me where every other thought in my head was Thank you, God, for being so aesthetic. Thank you for being such a wondrous, glorious God that you made such a wondrous, glorious, beautiful mechanism through which I could experience the world. Yes. Yes, this reflection is gorgeous. Yes, thank you. You see how those two things are completely different? Now, if I was emphasizing that shitty account of what happened, guess what would have happened? More lack, more this, more that, more depression, more sadness, more about what? Sad about what? There's nothing to be sad, you understand? So this is how it works. And I'll give you one more example before I wrap this up because I know this is long now. I have been traveling back and forth to Denmark since I got married about 10 years ago. And before that, I had been traveling just to travel. So I always travel, yeah? Yeah. Because I constantly travel, I always pick my seat. I always buy my ticket and then I go back and pick my seat because I like to sit in a window seat. So a couple of weeks ago, I get on the plane and I realize that I didn't fucking pick my seat. And this never happens to me. I'm always on top of this. And I'm looking at my boarding pass and it says something like 48H. And I'm like, holy shit, what's H? And I look up and you know what H is? H is the middle seat in the middle row. You know those four seats in the middle row that like people with their bratty kids sit in? Yeah. I was in the middle seat of the middle row and I'm like, oh God. Now, before I understood all the things that I've just explained to you, my reaction to this would have been so negative and so severe. Oh my God, this is going to be such a shitty trip. What the fuck? I can't sit in the middle like that. I'm going to freak out. I just ate all this weed chocolate. What the fuck am I going to do? I'm going to be tripping out next to like four random people. I don't want to be here in this eight hour flight. No. Instead, I looked at the boarding pass and I looked internally at myself and I was like, you know what, Umber? We're good. It's all good, man. We're all right. We're feeling good. We're on our way to Denmark to see our son. Shit couldn't be any better. Airbnb is hooked up. There's money coming in. I love my friends. I love my family. I love my son. Denmark is gorgeous in the summers. It's only eight hours. I got a stomach full of fucking medical cannabis. We are good. We are good. We are good. I'm good. I'm thinking this as I'm walking down the aisle on the plane. And I realize I can feel myself the more I think this, that I'm shifting back into alignment, slowly slipping back into alignment. And then I'm back in alignment. I know I'm back in alignment because I feel good. And I'm like, I'm feeling it. You know, I'm just like, you know, smiling at people walking through, you know, like thinking about all the cute guys in Denmark and how fun it's going to be to run around in Copenhagen and like meet guys and stuff. Hey, I'm single. Um, So I'm like back in alignment. I'm good. I'm walking down the aisle. I get to 48H. And there's this white lady sitting there in my seat. Now, as a brown person who has like a pretty deep, bassy kind of voice, I have to be really careful with white women because they get a bit like startled slash offended by me when, or like they, I come off as really abrasive when I just talk to them normally. So I often feel like Martin Lawrence in bad boys. Like there's a scene in bad boys where Will Smith, who is everything I 
Oh, I adore Will Smith. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a scene in Bad Boys where Will Smith and Martin Lawrence are walking into, are basically like breaking into a house, even though they're cops, they're breaking in. And Will Smith says, is anybody home? And Martin Lawrence stops him. He's like, nah, nah, nah. You can't, you got to take that bass out of your voice. White people, you, that, that bass in your voice scares white people. You got to talk in a high voice. Like, and he says, um, excuse me, we were just wondering if we could borrow some brown sugar. It's really funny. Anyway, so I have a tendency to speak to especially white women like that because when I speak to them normally, they have a tendency to get a little like flustered and like afraid. And then it's always like, oh, well, she's abrasive. She's aggressive. She was a bit, quote unquote, scary. So I see this woman sitting there in my seat and she's got this kind of doofy smile on her face. And I'm just like, what the fuck? So I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> Swear to God, this is how I talk to white people. Oh, hi. Hi. I think you're sitting in my seat, I said to her. And she smiled at me dumbly like she had no idea what I just said. And in fact, she didn't. She didn't speak English. She's Norwegian and doesn't speak English, which is weird to me because they have a great education system and they learn English there, but I guess she's just not fluent. Okay. So I look at her after I say this and she just gives me this kind of blank stare and the same doofy smile. And I'm just like, what the fuck's going on? And this man who's sitting next to her, looks at me and says, hi, this is my wife. And I said, okay. My wife is sitting in your seat. And I said, yeah, okay. And he said, can my wife sit here? Oh, uh, I'm going to be sitting in your seat, he said. That's what, I'm sorry. He said, I'm going to be sitting in your seat. And I said, okay, why? And he said, would you like to sit in first class? And I was like, what? He's like, see, the thing is, I'm with, I'm a producer with a TV show, and the TV show bought all the tickets for the crew. We're all flying first class. But my wife wanted to come on the trip, and it's been a multi-city trip. We've been to seven cities. And so I bought her seven tickets with my own money so she could come everywhere with us. But obviously, I can't afford to buy seven first class tickets, so I bought economy tickets. So every flight we take... Someone ends up getting really lucky and sitting in first class because I have to sit back here with my wife because she's afraid to fly. And the only thing that keeps her from getting flustered, that explains a doofy look on her face. She's fucking terrified of the plane or even being on the plane. She's like sweating and terrified. The only way that my wife can handle takeoff and landing and just being in the air is if she holds my hand and is near me. So I was wondering if you would please give me your seat and you can have my seat in first class. And I just started laughing. And he's like, what? And I was like, nothing. (laughs) Nothing. And in my head, I was like, power of manifestation. And no, actually, in my head, I was thinking, thank you, God. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Like, I swear to God, this is what I was doing in my head. I do this all the time. So I go up to first class and... Of course, I'm still completely in alignment, right? When things are better, they get better, they get better, they get better. So I'm like, oh, things just got a lot better. Now they're going to get even better. I'm sure of it. I go up to first class and the stewardess is already giving me this sly smile. And I'm like, why are you smiling at me like that? And me and stewardesses, me and waitresses, me and cab drivers, me and anyone in the service industry, we get along because I think people in the service industry are dope. And I think that people who look down on people in the service industry are fucking douchebags douche bags and I want nothing to do with people like that so me and the waitress me and the stewardess have already had a bit of a rapport and I'm like oh how long is this flight and oh I like your shoes those are cute you know whatever whatever so she gives me this sly smile as she's taking me up to first class and she's like you got lucky huh and she's Scandinavian Scandinavian women we like I, I I could fuck with Scandinavian women they're they're cool they're like tomboys so she's like oh you got lucky huh and I started laughing I'm like yeah I guess I did you know guess I did I'm and I said to her Just like I just told you a little bit ago. I said, well, I'm a very lucky person. And she said, well, you're about to get luckier. And then she pointed to my seat. Well, guess what? My seat was by the window. And in the seat next to me was this gorgeous, gorgeous, single, young Norwegian guy. And we hit it off the moment I sat down and we talked for eight hours straight. 
And now we're like emailing each other. I mean, I'm not interested in a relationship. I'm not interested in anything with anyone right now. But that's not the point, right? The point is I had a fucking phenomenal first class flight and I got to spend eight hours talking to this gorgeous, intelligent, interesting guy through the whole flight who like gave me this huge hug and helped me with my bags and all this shit. Like it was awesome, dude. It was awesome. And why? Because even when things started to shift out of balance or what seemed like shifting out of balance, I didn't budge from my place of alignment. I kept my faith in myself, in my belief that I am a good, lucky person who has good things happen to them because I am blessed by God, because God is still on the throne, because all good things are coming to me, because I was able to hold firm to that belief in the face of something that actually looked kind of horrendous for a second, something really, really, really great happened, right? Now, someone very cynical, someone Capricorn-esque would say, well, you just got lucky. Well, yeah, (laughs) That's exactly what I'm saying. I just got lucky, but I keep getting lucky, mashallah. I keep getting lucky. Mashallah for all the non-Muslims who are listening to this, mashallah just means by the grace of God. I keep getting lucky. Why? Because I believe that I am. Okay? So what you need to do if you want this manifestation to work for the project that you are working on, for the man that you want, for the marriage that you want, for the career that you want, for the weight you want to lose, for the guy who you need to come back and live with you and marry you and put a baby in your womb, what you need to do is you need to get in there and you need to root out the trashy fucked up, shitty beliefs that you have about yourself. Don't ask why they're there. Don't ask where they came from. Don't ask how they got there. Just rip it off like a fucking bandage and throw it out. And all the little holes that are left all over your heart and mind when you're done, fill them. Fill them with love for yourself, love of God, love of Christ, love of Buddha, whatever it is that floats your boat and makes you feel like an amazing, loved, beautiful little person held in the womb of love, whatever it is that takes you there, if that means that you need to smoke a joint and listen to Pink Floyd, whatever the fuck it is. My, my ex used to do this. So adorable. Whatever you need to do, do it. Do it because your life is short and you are here to manifest and create an experience. Okay. In the Bible, it says God created man. Why? 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 God created man to know himself. Okay, we are here to experience things because God is learning about himself through our experiences. We are learning about ourselves. We are learning about God through our experiences. We are here to have beautiful, wonderful experiences. Anyone that tells you that life has to be hard, anyone that tells you that making money has to be difficult, anyone that tells you that you have to struggle to get what you get, they're lying, They don't know, or they just don't know what they're talking about. They are misinformed. Life does not have to be hard. You do not have to struggle. You don't have to work hard. There is more than enough for everybody in the whole world 30 million times over. Okay? 30 million times over. How can you live on this planet, in this galaxy, in this universe with all this beauty and abundance around you and think that something as paltry and small as money would be limited by the most high, by the universe, by whatever mechanism you choose to believe is running this shit? How could you possibly? How can there be an abundance of everything except for you? It doesn't work that way. Everything you want is sitting waiting for you on a frequency that you need to get on before it can come to you. The first thing you do is you root out the shitty beliefs. The second thing you do is you implement new beliefs. No matter how crazy, no matter how idealistic, no matter how childish they sound, you know mine, I'm lucky, I'm lucky, I'm lucky. My other one that I have that's deeply held is I'm hot. I'm hot. I'm super hot. (laughs) I am. I just am. I just am. (laughs) right? 
So the second thing you do is you implement these insistent, almost childish, simple beliefs of how worthy you are and how loved you are. And then the third piece of this is you do actual physical things that you can do to raise your vibration to make this ability to manifest even stronger. Pray, eat food high in vibration, stop eating dead things or cut it down as much as you can, or at least eat halal, eat something that has the name of God prayed over it, so you're not just eating dead things, okay? Eat things that raise your vibration. Meditate. Meditation is the same as prayer. Meditation is the same as running. Meditation is the same as dancing. Meditation is the same as fucking, even if you're doing it the right way, okay? Find ways to find that beautiful connection and alignment to source, whether that's sitting quietly with your crystals or whether that's, you know, swimming or running through, running on the beach or running in the park or playing with your cat or doing your schoolwork because you know you're the bomb and you're going to do really well and you're going to, you know, be a great writer or wh- whatever it is that brings you closer to alignment and closer to feeling good about who you are and what you're doing here. Do those things. If you can do one, two, three, if you can do these three things, you will start to see that your reality, the reflection of the inside of your mind, as your mind cleans up, your reality will clean up. And you will be hitting me up on Instagram a month from now going, bitch, I met this dude, bitch, I wrote this chapter, bitch, I passed this exam, bitch, that dude came back, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, I promise you, it works. There haven't been people saying it since the beginning of time because it doesn't work. Just look at how persistent this belief is. Go back, go back, look, look throughout history. Look at all the great spiritual teachers we've had. Not even spiritual teachers. Look at Marcus Aurelius. Look at the great politicians and statesmen. Look at the great Greek philosophers. Everyone is saying the same thing. This is a reflection. And it's a reflection of the inside of you. You change the inside of you, you change this reflection, and you start manifesting. So let's fucking get to it, ladies. We're divine manifestors, man. We're the divine feminine. It, we are the bridge through which souls come into this world. If there's anyone who can receive, it's us, man. Use it. Use it. Stop seeing this as such a negative. Stop seeing this as something that makes you weak. You are a woman. You are stronger in terms of manifestation than anything on this planet. You are chosen. In the Quran, it says that paradise is under a mother's feet. Okay? That is the stature of woman. That is the stature of the giver of life, the creator of life in this plane. And that's what we are. So let's do it. Let's do it until that Beyonce song is true and we are running this place and you are running your own world and then hit me up, get back to me to be like, thank you, girl, because I'll be here. (laughs) I'll be here.